Uh, but I mostly go by Termi on the internet. Uh, that's T E R M I E, like on top there. Um, that's on all the all the thingies. Um, I'm mostly familiar with Finland because I uh, worked on Jaiku um, with uh, Thamo back there um, some years ago before we got uh, acquired by Google. Um, it was mostly PHP on the front end and uh, Twisted on the back end. Um, but then once we got to Google, it switched to being uh, all Python, Django, uh, and on App Engine. Um, since then, I quit Google. Um, I started working on a project uh, for NASA with like some old uh, old coworkers of mine um, called Nova. That was basically uh, something that starts up virtual machines. Um, basically, NASA spends outrageous amounts of money on um, buying hardware and like paying sys administrators to, to administer these hardware. Um, it's something like thirty-five thousand dollars or something like this uh, to go through all the security audits if you want to have a um, like a, a an IP address, basically. So it's it's quite a lot, and then there's recurring costs every year. Um, so they really wanted a cloud inside their their uh, system. Um, so yeah, that, the project ended up, we open sourced it. Uh, Rackspace was open sourcing some of their software, and it became OpenStack, uh, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, and then recently, Rackspace acquired the company that I was working for for NASA um, in January. Uh, I enjoy bicycling, beer, uh, VI, two space and dense, um, pickles, and uh, philosophical debates about code style. Um, I'm a Python developer, have been for quite a while. I like Python a lot. Um, I like complaining about other languages, so. If we have beer later on, we can do some of that. Um, so OpenStack. I'm really worried that this screen is going to be slightly too small for my code examples later on. Um, so uh, who here is familiar with Amazon EC2 or Rackspace Cloud? Oh, good. OK. And has anybody actually used those? OK, awesome. So uh, OpenStack is an open source, uh, is open source software for basically if you wanted to run your own Amazon EC2 um, or or Rackspace Cloud, um, or Amazon S3. Um, it's all Python. Um, it's it's targeted mostly at companies who want to run sort of private clouds, because they either, so for example, in NASA's case, there's a lot of information that they're not legally allowed to have on other servers besides their own. Um, a lot of people just want to take advantage of the development, uh, the development sort of philosophy with cloud stuff. You can have a development environment that is very similar to de your deployment environment. Um, there's a lot of built-in security, because you can keep VMs off of different networks and stuff like this. Um, so a lot of people want that. Um, OpenStack itself is a few projects. Uh, the two big ones are Swift, which is the thing that's like S3. Um, it's actually in production right now at uh, Rackspace. It's what runs cloud files. Um, so they've been running for years now, I think. And they basically open sourced that software when OpenStack was formed. Um, and uh, the other one is uh, Nova, the part that I work on, um, or well, work on the most. Um, there's also a bunch of smaller projects, um, and but Nova is basically the part that provisions VMs, uh, attaches volumes to those, so like EBS, um, if you're familiar with that. Uh, the project as a whole is pretty popular now. Um, we have something like 160 contributors. Um, there's a gazillion companies that are involved. Uh, everybody kind of wants to like stamp and say like either we support OpenStack or we will do consulting for OpenStack or we're developing cool software for it. Um, companies like Dell, HP. Um, Cisco, uh, Sony, um, all those people are in it. Uh, even Microsoft wants a little piece of the action. They're doing. Uh, they're making sure we have Hyper-V support, which is uh, Microsoft's hypervisor. Um, and uh, yeah, the whole thing's in, in Python, which is awesome, because that means I get to fly around the world and go to cool Python conferences um, and talk to my people. Uh, if you have any specific OpenStack uh, questions, feel free to ask afterwards, um, and I'm around. Um, so. On to the cool stuff. So these are the cool tech I'm going to be talking about. Um, PXE, um, it's a way to, it's, well, Pixie. Um, it's a way to network boot actual machines, like so bare metal. Um, Vagrant, which is a command line tool um, for spawning virtual machines. Um, it's cross-platform as well, which is nice. Um, LXE, which is uh, relatively new, but it's a Linux-specific thing that is um, wicked fast, uh, like things that look a lot like a virtual machine. And then uh, Open vSwitch, which is this virtualized networking stuff that's pretty uh, hardcore. Um, yeah, this would be great. Let's see. Awesome. OK, um, so Pixie is really old, but I didn't find out about it until I used OpenStack, until I started working on it. Um, many, many of you may be familiar with it. It's, it's, it's often how people deploy, um, deploy sort of like large clusters of machines. Um, basically, it's. In simple terms, it's just a way to set which boot device uh, 
like a, a computer is going to use, um, or rather, you boot from the Pixie boot device, and then it figures <coughs> out what it should do. Um, often, this is going to be uh, booting from an image served of the network. So it's going to you're going to provide like a a RAM disk and a kernel and things like this, and then it's going to boot into that image and then do some other stuff to provision the rest of the machine. Um, basically, you use it to install bare metal. Um, we use it to rapidly deploy all of our uh, like cloud software. So basically, we have a bunch of uh, apt packages, and then we basically pixie boot a bunch of machines, and then they all get the new versions of everything. Um, and it also works via TFTP, which is ridiculously old, but it's, um, it's like 1980. It's, I don't know. I, don't, I wasn't born then. <laughs> but, uh, but basically, it's, uh, it's integrated into all kinds of random extra things, because it's, it's a very low-level network uh, like protocol for transferring files, and so it's how P uh, it's how Pixie fetches images. Um, this is an example of like a, a Pixie config. Um, this big number on top is basically a MAC address. Um, so what will happen is TFTP will hit a directory, try to find a, a file that has its MAC address, the MAC address of the machine that it's talking from, and then if it gets something like this, it'll start it'll start uh, uh, providing the, the new kernel. So for example, the kernel in this case would be Natty. Um, these are all just directories, again, inside this TFTP directory. Um, but basically, yeah, it's the, the interesting parts are basically the kernel and the RAM disk, the initRD is the RAM disk. Um, and then the fact that you can actually, for pre-seed, you can actually just pass a URL. Um, so it can actually fetch a file over the network again, um, in H over HTTP in this case. Um, this is because these are variables passed on to um, like the natty kernel or whatever. So it knows that it's what it's supposed to do with pre-seed. But basically, it lets you configure the systems over the network. Um, next up on the cool tech is Vagrant. Um, it's a command line interface responding VirtualBox. So VirtualBox is useful mostly because it works on uh, Mac, Windows, and Linux. Uh, so you can actually write the same code and run it in all the places and write tests against it and such and know that it's going to work. Um, it's, uh, it's really quick. It's really easy to set up uh, it's in Ruby. So Good luck. You know, you have you always have to do the uh, like every time you try to install a gem in Ruby. Like, who's who here likes Ruby? No. Um, uh, every time you try to install a gem in Ruby, it fails, and then you run gem update dash dash system, and then it succeeds. Um, it's ridiculous that I have to do that every single time. But um, anyway, <laughs> Ruby, uh, and it also integrates with Chef and Puppet. So uh, Chef and Puppet are both uh, sort of the current hip configuration management systems. Um, they're both in Ruby as well. Um, they, they take slightly different approaches to how they uh, how they provision things, but uh, basically VirtualBox uh, or Vagrant has really cool integration with it. Um, so the the basic thing is in a Vagrant file is that it's going to say which uh, which like image to load, which is the box. It basically wraps up that kernel and RAM disk and stuff that like Pixie would use, puts it all in one spot. Um, the other cool thing is it has a built-in way to share uh, share directories off of your local computer into the into the actual box. So, for example, if you're spawning multiple a bunch of them, you'll usually want to use uh, your you'll want to set your app cache and then have that dumped into dumped into the thing itself so that they don't all fetch the same things over the internet every time. And then the final part is uh, this chef integration. So you basically give it recipes or or formulas or in Puppet you would give it roles, um, and that defines which things are going to get installed on the system. And so uh, Anso was the name of our company. That's why we're installing the Anso cookbooks. But uh, basically, this is a, a quick way to bootstrap a server. Um, often, you'll include things like um, your environment settings and your vimrcs and such, um, or whatever Emacs uses. Uh, <laughs> uh, LXE, oh, this is my finished joke. All right. um, LXE is awesome. LXE is my, my favorite thing right now. It's, uh, it takes a little bit of work to set up, but basically, it's like a super cheroot. Um, it it basically takes over a little section of your of your hard drive and treats it like a virtual machine. Um, you can still interact with that from the from the host, so you can still just write new files into the virtual machine. So it makes it very easy to share things, um, link things in, and stuff like this. It boots in like a second. Basically, once you once it's done the first boot the first time, every time after that is it's it's immediately up. The network interfaces, everything just comes up right away. So whenever you're setting up new um, we, we basically, when we're developing OpenStack, we're constantly, OpenStack sort of takes over your whole computer. Like if you're gonna run, if you're gonna run a bunch of virtual machines, you're not really gonna be doing a lot else on that computer. So we basically don't wanna have to blow away our entire system every time, every time we wanna test a new change. So we, we spawn, we spawn virtual machines um, to do all of our testing. 
Um, and so LXC makes our testing much, much, much faster. Uh, because again, it only takes a second or so to start up. We have tests that take longer than that. So um, it looks like a VM, but it actually isn't. You can kill processes from the host machine if you want and do all kinds of weird, nasty things. Um, it uses something called C groups, which I don't think there's any point in learning about, but um, it's kind of neato. Um, it's also really great if you're, uh, for anybody who's doing sort of platform as a service type things, um, there it runs, it's not actually virtualized. So that means it's, um, it's very fast. So anything you virtualize, you get something from a 5 to 15% um, lag on the <laughs> CPU and I.O. and stuff like this. Um, they're always trying to bring that down. But LXD, because it's not actually virtualized, uh, gets none of that. So it runs at full bare metal speed, um, which means it's great for doing things like uh, providing a database service to some other, to some other, uh, some other utility. Um, we'll probably be using that for our load balancing as a service and a couple things like this when we write them. Um, Uh-oh. All right, these uh, MacBook Airs fall asleep really fast. I haven't set the settings yet. Um, it does require a bit of setup the first time. Um, so this is like a common type thing you would probably do. Um, most of the configuration is setting up the network, um, which means you're going to have to know a little bit about network stuff, which is unfortunate. Um, if you're anything like me, when you see the word bridge, it means don't select this because you're going to lose the connection to the, the remote host. Um, <laughs> And so having to turn on a bridge on like a remote host is a very scary thing for me. But I had enough coworkers who knew what to do that eventually we came up with an, an effective shell script that you know that handles it. Anyway, so yeah, basically you you bridge on your host and then you hook the LXC containers into it. Um, this little LXC create is the part that uh, takes the longest the first time. Um, and then uh, you basically copy any extra cool stuff you want into the root file system. In this case, I'm copying you know, my environment so that I can SSH in really quickly and, um, and things like this. And then the startup from then on is only about a second. Um, open vSwitch. Uh, it's really cool. It's like this virtualized networking thing. Um, it's really complicated. Uh, there is something called open flow. There's all kinds of weird stuff. But if you're, into, if you're doing any kind of networking stuff at all right now, it's definitely something you should look at. Um, I'm not really a network guy, so I don't really feel like I can explain it super well. But I feel like I should throw it out there because uh, it's, it's wicked cool. It's going to change probably a lot of how networking stuff works in the future. It's very on the fly, customizable, um, and things like this. Um, but yeah, I don't really know about it. So I'm uh, just going to punt on that one. That's an that's a American football term. It means uh, you're giving, giving up. Uh, so here's some cool tools. Um, hopefully, you already know about some of these. And uh, if not, you're going to be so excited for uh, So pip, it's basically a better easy install. Um, it's a, uh, it seems to know about everything. So it, it, it'll install things from files, from tarballs, from arbitrary URLs, from uh, Git repositories, Mercurial repositories, SPN repositories. Um, it'll figure out, if you give it a link just a Google code page, you can figure out how to install from there. Um, it has, uh, it has a great thing called like a, a pip requires file that you can use. Basically, it's a great way to define dependencies on your projects. So um, I'll show an example in a sec. Um, but basically, it's, uh, it integrates very well with virtual env, which I'll also be talking about, um, which gives you a really great way if you're working on multiple projects or multiple versions of projects to make sure you're keeping all your dependencies in line. If you're installing everything from apt every time, you're going to basically um, be stuck with everything in the world has Django 1.2, and you really want to use Django 1.3 on some project, so now you're kind of screwed. Um, so pip and virtual env really help a lot with that. A uh, common pip requires file would look something like this. Um, dash e means editable, so it actually installs it in development mode, which means you can actually go in and it's just some linked into your path, so you can actually uh, edit files locally, which is useful if you're working on like cutting edge or bleeding edge uh, trunk stuff. Um, you can either specify specific um, specific file versions, um, so like Django 1.3 there. Um, Nova admin client just means get the latest one, whatever it is, um, or really it just means any. Um, so if, if you run it again, it won't update. Um, and then yeah, this uh, you can install from GitHub pages and things like this directly. Um, this little thing on the end that says a equals uh, basically tells it what for for the sake of dependencies future, later on, um, it'll tell it what the name of the what dependency is satisfying? You had a question? Uh, actually, pip doesn't uh, update your stuff automatically. You have to tell it to update. You you only have to tell it to update if you didn't if you didn't put a larger version. 
So with no, this Nova admin client, it won't update um, unless you tell it you force it to update. I don't think but with Jang if you have Django one two installed and you then it sees Django one three, it'll it'll try to get the new version. Uh, I think I have been burned once by people not actually updating without me telling me to update, even if the requirements listed a new version of that. I, it's, it's possible. I'm pretty sure that if you list a newer version, it'll definitely try to get to the newer version. Um, I definitely know that it won't get newer versions if you don't list a version, um, which is, yeah, definitely kind of annoying. Um, uh, virtual env, um, it's, it takes a second to set up, which is really the reason why people don't use it, but everybody should definitely be using it. Um, theoretically, my uplifting statement is going to be a little bit about why you shouldn't have to use it, but um, but basically it keeps all of your packages, all your Python packages separate for different projects. Um, so the idea being, again, if, if you have Django 1.2 on one project, Django uh, 0 0.9 on another one, you don't want to have to keep flipping like symlinks or something somewhere between this. Um, so basically, virtual m installs a new, an entirely new Python binary and um, makes separate package repositories for every project you want to work on. Um, it's, it was very important for me when I was working with a lot of different clients because they all have different requirements and I can't force them all to update at the same time. Um, and really, if you're using it, the only, the only people I know who use it use it with a wrapper, which is this uh, virtual env wrapper, um, .sh, which is awesome. It integrates very well with your shell. Um, and I really wouldn't ever use it without it. Um, I do. You do? What do you What do you use instead? Like uh, I use it just make shell scripts from the actual web runner. Oh, so you you just run you run your own shell script instead of yeah. Do you? I, no, I don't set the the part from the shell as I'm running. I run the separate shell script that point to the actual part in my computer. Oh, okay. I mean, I mean, I have shell shell scripts that do specific stuff and they wait for the actual runner. So I guess we have something sort of similar because we use um, it's in the hacks section later on, but we make it we make virtual environments like local virtual environments when we run tests, and then we also have a script that's uh, with vmv.sh, so that says run this Python this Python script with this inside this virtual environment, and then it knows about the local one. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'm definitely a big fan of the virtual env wrapper. Um, it's a little bit weird installing it on uh, Ubuntu for some reason. It doesn't really put um, it doesn't. It's some. It, it, it doesn't really like tell you what, that you need to do something else once you're done installing. You will have to link link that thing into your. You'll have to source it somewhere. Um, but basically, once you do, um, you'll be able to make a make a new virtual env for whatever project you're on. It'll give you output kind of like this, um, and then it'll add this this guy to your uh, to your prompt saying so you can see which virtual env you're in. You can deactivate it by going out of it. Um, so you can get out of it, or you can type work on. And it'll autocomplete and everything too, so you can see which ones you're on. Uh, anyway, it's pretty badass. So here's a new one that I just uh, ran into pretty recently. Go ahead. Question about those virtual ends. Have you uh, tried a tool called Build Out? Uh, no. What is it? Build Out. Big Out. Build Out. Build out. Someone need build, build Out. Like Build Out. Oh, Build Out. Yeah. Um, so I've used build out a couple times. I don't really recommend it. Um, I know that, for example, uh, like Jacob Kaplan Moss on Django really loves it. It has some cool, um, it has some cool, like recipes for things. But I, I find that it, more often than not, it really just confuses people as to how to run tests because then they have to go look up what build out is and what they need to run in order to build it and then run the tests. And um, I don't really like that. I, I think it's much easier to have a shell script that's very easy to see that runs the tests and does the build stuff for you. Um, but yeah, build out it does seem pretty cool. I just haven't. I'm not very comfortable with it yet. Um, does it do something like virtual env? I guess it just installs locally and, and modifies the path, right? Yeah, and it, it, it's uh, very good handling dependencies. Mm -hmm. If you have a lot of packages and they have different dependencies and you have conflicts and stuff like that. We, so we have we basically have a script that it's it's in the hack section that is um, to basically install all the dependencies in a local virtual environment. Um, does build out doesn't actually use virtual env or does it? Uh, it doesn't. It, 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 it does it itself inside. inside. Okay. Um, so Shaco is pretty different from the rest of the things that I was talking about. Um, Shaco is basically a tool that gives you pretty HTML output that documents a shell script. Um, so if you ever have like a long shell script, like we tend to because we're 
we're always doing a lot of um, system setup to get all the things configured correctly to run together. Um, it can be really long. You comment it well, but it's still kind of hard to read. And um, all right, uh, but it basically generates pretty HTML. Um, it looks good. We use it for. Um, we have a, a big long script that does a bunch of setup that has gotten a lot of traction in the OpenStack community just because we use this Chaco tool and it made it very easy to figure out what the script is doing. Um, uh, it looks like this, but that's really tiny. See what they're basically. Uh, um, basically, it prints, it prints your comments on one side next to the scripts that are happening on the other side. Um, so it basically allows you to annotate each thing. And then as you go by, you can, read, you can basically read the comments uh, like as one long file, as like, kind of like a readme. Um, but you actually, when you write it, you intersperse them with the actual code. Um, so anybody who looks at the script gets what they usually expect. But anybody, you can go to this HTML page and get like, this really beautiful output that's explaining what the code's doing. It also does syntax highlighting and stuff like this on the side. Um, so yeah, it ends up working out really well. Um, we've been very happy with using it. Um, uh, couple, one of the first bonuses. Um, so this presentation is using deck.js. I found out about it last night and then stayed up all night messing with CSS trying to get it to work. Um, it, doesn't, it, doesn't have exactly, it doesn't tell you all exactly the things you need to use to make it work. Um, but you know, you'll figure it out. Uh, but it's pretty cool. It's actually it's nice. It's just a big HTML file. So I can throw this all in, uh, in Git and whatever as I work on it. Um, and uh, you can do cool stuff with JavaScript and CSS while you're, while you're trying to get it done. Um, and yeah, it seems to have been working so far. It's even nice that I can resize the, resize the uh, text when the screen is too small. Um, then eventlet. So if you were, I guess everybody here was at the talk this morning where he was uh, talking about Twisted and uh, sort of not being very happy with it. And now they're using uh, gevent. Um, eventlet is sort of like the precursor to gevent. I haven't actually played with gevent too much yet. Uh, but basically, the concept for both of them is that it takes, uh, takes all the socket communication you do in Python, um, and then it makes all of those non-blocking. So basically, whenever you are doing, whenever you're doing a network I.O., whenever it has a, has a wait, it'll run other coroutines for you. Um, and so it's cooperative coroutines. Um, you write all your code in a standard imperative style. Everything looks really normal, um, except that it network stuff doesn't block your code, and um, you can do some other cool things like spawning, spawning uh, like you know, coroutine threads to do different stuff in the background. Um, one of the things that I use it for is with um, with uh, Django. Um, so I have I have like this random Django app that I use for doing a lot of deployment to bare metal, and a lot of the a lot of the commands it has to run are basically shell commands. Um, Django, I don't want to have to block every time someone updates the database. I don't want to block on the shell commands. So I, um, but I do trigger on database updates. So I basically have it spawn, spawn uh, greenlets, which are what eventlet uses. Basically spawns little threads that handle the shell scripts in the background. Um, it works with cool things like 0MQ, uh, which is pretty awesome if you haven't played with it yet. Um, it should probably be on this, but I didn't want to list every neat thing. But, um, but yeah, 0MQ makes sockets like do what you think sockets should do. And it's pretty awesome. And anyway, it integrates very well with, uh, with eventlet. Um, Eventlet also already has a WSGI server, a whiskey as we call them. Um, and uh, yeah, basically I don't think anybody should ever use Twisted again. I used to use it a lot and I, you know, I learned a lot from it, but uh, really every time we had new developers come on, they had no idea what was going on. It took a long time to ramp up and then they would still do things kind of incorrectly for the first, you know, five or six times. Um, so it just, there was a lot of time spent dealing with, uh, dealing with that. Um, here's like a quick example of what eventlet code looks like. It's not really even, it's, I couldn't find like a good example because it doesn't look different than regular Python code. So nothing you're doing, so this is basically how you would spawn a whiskey server. Um, this is actually a Django command, so if you're using Django, you can just drop, drop this file in and it would basically make Django run under eventlet's whiskey instead of whatever the default uh, Django whiskey is, uh, which means that it, it will have non-blocking IO and can spawn background threads which is kind of nice. Um, um, so some of our cool hacks. Um, uh, RAM disks is a thing that I, I've always, you know, you've always heard the word every time you like install new Linux that you have a RAM disk, but you never really think about it too much. Um, install VM, the thing that gets all our dependencies. Um, 
and then some neat little things that we do in our scripts that maybe you guys will like and want to use in yours. Um, so building a RAM disk, uh, it takes a while for like real servers to reboot. Like if you have like a big server in a data center, it does all these memory checks and all this other stuff. Um, and basically the boot process will be multiple minutes um, before it even gets to a part that's going to be like provisioning your software or doing it like this. Um, so one of the little hacks we did was say, hey, how about we just build the entire system in the RAM disk? There's enough, there's enough RAM on the system to have like a gig of RAM lo uh, located to this, um, this RAM disk. And so what we basically do is build our entire OpenStack testing box in RAM disk, um, pass that over, over from Pixie. So basically, the server never has to reboot twice. It, re it boots once, loads everything in RAM, mounts the, that mounts the hard disks that are available to it, and then runs the tests, um, which cuts basically about five minutes or so off of our sort of testing stuff. There are certain things that we have to test on bare metal, because most computers can't do virtualization within virtualization very quickly. Um, uh, although there are some cool AMD processors that do that, um, I think Intel just came out with some too. But that's actually pretty fun when you do when you have your cloud and your cloud and your cloud. Um, we do that a lot for uh, for testing. Um, but yeah, basically it's it's good for testing small changes that need to actually run on, on bare metal. Um, and it's everybody we tell it to thinks it's like a terrible terrible hack. So I figured I'd tell you guys to do, to do it. Um, Install virtual um, We I've talked about this a little bit already, but basically we just have a script that makes sure to install a local virtual env and then yank in all the dependencies that we have for the project um, so that when we're testing from shell scripts, everybody has the same environment. Um, go ahead. Did you ever consider Fabric for this? This sounds like a Fabric. Kind of so, so other people have mentioned Fabric. So the only, the only thing I've ever used Fabric for has been um, running commands on remote servers. Um, basically running configuration on remote servers. I'm not familiar with it as a as a tool to do local local dependency checking or anything. Is is that a common use? Yeah, you you uh, check um, using fabric if you have a requirements file. So basically, you just have to give a naming convention so that uh, fabric understands where to look for requirement lists mm -hmm. and then have it uh, like remotely iterate over it or or use it uh, dash r. So, so that yeah, that's interesting for doing remote stuff um, because that would make that would be nice for us because we don't really like to deal with the guys who write the packages um, because they're either slow slower than stuff or think things should be installed differently than we do. Um, so that's interesting. Um, this is only for local for development for like local testing. So this is mostly so that somebody checks out checks out the code and they run tests they'll have the same thing as everybody else, so that when they get bugs and things, it's actually related to the code that they have, that, that we think they have, rather than what's like installed in their system somewhere. Um, but you think Fabric can be used for the same? Yeah, well, I, mean, I use it also locally for testing. Like, uh, the, I have an SSH key that gets me inside my computer. Like, it's it's uh -huh. kind of silly to do it that way. That okay. You open an SSH connection to yourself, but it's very close to what reality would be. Mm -hmm. And then you can still like deploy it and you get all the benefits of virtual life. And it's very similar. But it's a good idea to, to, I think it's a good idea to do it the same way locally as it would be. Yeah. It, this, is, this is also, it might also be interesting because, I mean, most of our tests are being run remotely on virtual machines inside of our own computers. And so, um, so if we can use that to, Fabric already has good good stuff for getting like output back from running running, running like results and things like this. So if we use Fabric to run our tests and build the dependencies, might be a good idea. Um, uh, it's too small. Let's see. There we go. Um, so this is a simple thing. This is basically we use nose tests to run our tests, but nose has really ugly output. There's a few different types of output you can try to get out of it, but um, Twisted always had much much nicer output. And so when we switched away from using Twisted, uh, the first thing I did was hack up something so that nose would look like Twisted. Um, and so basically, it, it has you know the test suite on, on top and indented. They have each test. Um, nose usually writes them all next to each other, and it gets very very long and ugly. Um, the other thing is we did uh, we lined up this OK and yes on the other side, or OK and fail, so that it's very easy to see when something fails. When it also when it fails, it's uh, marked in red. And then you can't see, you can't really see the color too well, but these are red. So it's basically, it's, it's doing timing on each test. 
Um, and that way you can find what your slow tests are. And so anything that takes more than a second is marked in red. And then we try to optimize those tests to be faster. Um, and then at the end, we dump, we dump a list of the fastest things. Um, this isn't a library or anything that's available anywhere, but the link, in, the link in here will show all the code that we use to make those act that way. Um, it's a pretty simple, pretty simple hack, but it uh, makes testing a lot nicer than it was before. So, so are, you, are, you, are you transforming Nose output? No, we're, um, I'm actually hacking into the Nose test runner. So I've, I've, done, I've done like an unusual amount of work inside Pi, Pi unit test or whatever. Um, so I've, I'm comfortable like messing with their output. It's really, it takes a while to figure out how it all works, but I, I ported um, unit test to Node because I was using Node.js and so much of Node.js stuff is written by crazy Ruby people. And so they have things like, like uh, what is it, RSpec is like a, a Ruby testing framework where you write everything in like natural languages, natural language with like strings and, and stuff. And so somebody made like JS spec and I really hate how it works. And so I just wanted like a, Reliable X units kind of style of, of testing, and so I ported the, the Python unit test to, to JavaScript. And so anyway, yeah, I, I've, I was familiar enough to mess with it. Um, basically, it just there's an there's an output like emit, and you just check whether or not it's if it's if it's a new suite, do the suite. Otherwise, just uh, print only half of it. No, it's 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 done as it's kind of, kind of hacky right now. So I can I couldn't figure out how to do it as a plugin. I originally tried to, um, but the plugin hooks in those weren't in the right spots, and so there is a way. So yeah, it's probably there's probably a way to do it, but I didn't know didn't know nose well enough to do it. I knew unit test well enough to to, to do it. Uh, but yeah, it's it's there if you want to contribute it. <laughs> uh, we're happy happy to do that. Um, then this one is just like a weird, weird random thing, but I hadn't seen anybody else do it before. Uh, so we have a lot of different processes as part of as part of OpenStack. So to run Nova, you're going to run like a network, a network service, a um, like a volume service, an API service, and all these different services. And it can be kind of annoying when you're on the on the command line having to like spawn and background those all, or do whatever you're going to do to run those all, so that you can run your little test against it, your quick manual test. Um, so we wrote basically a thing that it creates one new named screen that has multiple windows, and then each new screen it dumps like a, it starts up a process in a new window. So when you pop open screen, you have a little list of tabs on the bottom that show all the different processes, and you can use screen commands like control A, uh, double quotes, will give you like a list of all the windows that you can just click which one you want, um, or select with your, uh, but yeah, anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a very simple little hack, but I think um, more people should do it because it makes it really easy to launch a bunch of different uh, things at once. Um, so here's my here's my plug. Um, uh, when our project first started, um, we were all using Git because Git's the best thing in the universe. Um, but when we sort of joined this OpenStack thing, for some reason they were. Um, where OpenStack is relatively heavily in bed with Ubuntu, and Ubuntu uses Launchpad. Um, they're the only people who use Launchpad, um, but they really wanted us to use Launchpad too. Uh, Launchpad uses BZR. Um, I really hate BZR. So um, I wrote this thing called Git BZR NG. It's kind of a joke on when BZR came out, first came out, it was called Bizarre NG. Um, but I don't think anybody ever used it back then, so nobody knows the joke. But um, but anyway, it's a bi-directional git bzr bridge. So if you ever actually have to, like, for some reason, interact with the bzr library, you can do git bzr clone that library and then interact with it as a git as a git repo and push your changes back and, and do all that sort of thing. And so I think uh, people should know about that. I'm trying to. I'm on the like anti bzr like propaganda committee. So I need to slowly make everybody use git instead. Uh, and it's all in Python. Um, uh, so here is where I come up with an uplifting. Uplifting statement. Um, so we uh, there has been a lot of talk about virtual ends and things like this. Um, I so I've been using LXC quite a bit, and I think it's started making. It feels very funny to me that this idea that, for example, I need um, like root privileges to install something, or that I have a, uh, I have this home directory where I can install some stuff locally, um, when in fact with LXC I can spawn an entirely new computer in about a second. Every time I want to work on something, I can make a template for it. I can I can turn them on and off whenever I want. Um, 
I feel like I should basically do all my development just inside of whichever VM is appropriate for that project. Um, so it, it seems very, I think like in the, in the future, this is gonna be how we are actually interacting with computers. I think this, this idea of a multi-tenant multi like home, different users on your Linux box is something that will slowly be going away as um, com computing is commoditized, right? So OpenStack is trying to commoditize the idea of cloud, is trying to commoditize computing. So the idea is that anytime you have like some task or something you wanna run, you can pop open a computer somewhere that's nearby theoretically, um, and it's, you can run it in there. If you need like 80 computers, you can get 80 computers to like parallel process your stuff. Um, so this idea that you have a, a local thing that you have root access, you, have, you need root access um, and multi-tenants on the same system, to me seems like a very old idea that is gonna sort of fade out. Um, I really think where we'll be moving is things like LXC um, and that sort of thing uh, in the future where basically every, every task is basically, you know, hit the big red button, you have a new computer that's set up exactly how you want it and do whatever you need to do in there. Um, part of the thing, part of the reason I like working on OpenStack is because I think we're kind of, we get to help move towards that. Um, I don't think, I don't think that there should be a reason why, I'm very supportive of this idea that, um, you guys have to keep looking at my face. Um, <laughs> I'm very, I'm very supportive of this, this idea that, uh, so like cloud is, is like a neat idea, right? It's sort of proprietary for people like Amazon or Rackspace now. If you want to do cloud computing, you kind of have to use like their stuff. Um, you know, I, I like to say WordPress. WordPress.com is nice, it's cool that you can go host your blog on WordPress.com easily, but I don't like the fact that as we move towards those things, it diminishes from me being able to run something locally. Like I want to be able to run my own WordPress. I want to be able to run, use my computers as a cloud, um, use that same that same uh, interface um, for for my own stuff. Um, I don't think that that should be only in the hands of big companies. Um, as we move towards software as a service, uh, throughout throughout the industry is a very popular thing now. Um, we're sort of continuously taking away from the ability of the individual, um, and I think OpenStack is giving that back. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm happy to be working on it. I hope you feel uplifted. Uh, Are you using KXEC for uh, fast rebooting your uh, servers? So we, we do that. Um, we've integrated that with one of our tools. Um, I don't know a lot about it. It was written, all written by somebody else. Uh, but yeah, he's using that for fast uh, fast rebooting um, to do exactly the same sort of things we're doing with like the RAM disk and whatnot. So basically keeping a uh, pristine copy of the disk and then like popping that through quickly. Um, I don't know a lot about it yet, though. What are your guys' favorite tools? Anything I didn't mention? We promise to have questions. Yeah, you guys promise to have questions. Uh, can you uh, explain a little bit more about OpenStack? How it compares to Amazon? Well, one to one. We we support almost all. Like, so we have like a compatibility API for EC2. Um, Mark Shuttleworth just wrote a big blog entry about this actually, saying that he thinks we should only have an Amazon API. Um, but in fact, yeah, we support a variety of different things from Amazon also that we have to try to map into their, their thing. For example, we support like um, like VNC consoles um, into, into instances, which I don't think Amazon does, but I think Rackspace does. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, not, all, not everything maps onto their API. Uh, we have almost all their features except for, I don't know, there might, there might be some small one that we, we don't have. Um, we also have most of Rackspace's features, and then we have a bunch of extra weird ones that um, are things that we needed, or like large companies are always trying to add support for their like um, SANS and like NetApp and all kinds of weird things as backends for stuff, uh, different drivers. Um, we support a lot of different hypervisors. So if you want to run under Zen, or if you want to run under KVM, or under Hyper-V, or ESXi, I think is what VMware uses. Um, there's, there's a company, Citrix, that's involved in the project that they're basically, their stated goal is to destroy VMware. Um, and so they're doing everything they can to make sure that we support all of VMware's stuff really well without using VMware. Um, <laughs> and so, um, so yeah, you basically, you'll get all the same features. Um, we have some less, less uh, redundancy in some, in some cases. Um, but, uh, but yeah, for private, if it's running privately, it's, it's effectively equivalent. Um, and you can use, we use, uh, we test using 
Botto, which is like an Amazon EC2 uh, client library that everybody uses in Python. So we just run all our tests through that. Uh, say you want to build, for example, your own EC2 clone or whatever. Uh, what does it take to install OpenStack and configure uh, to um, thing? So there's a few different there's a few different uh, like paths to do that. Um, Ubuntu has it built in, or so Ubuntu you can just like install all the pieces, and theoretically if those guys are doing their job correctly, then you'll have all the pieces you need to run. There's still a few things that uh, like if you want to use volumes, you probably have to create like a, a hard drive, or you have to tell it where to attach volumes from, and things like this. Um, we have there's a bunch of different scripts and stuff like this to set it up, and a bunch of different walkthroughs. The documentation is actually quite good. Um, we have a lot of people working on that and making sure it's up to date. Um, we use uh, to avoid dealing with the because we develop it a lot. Um, we we install everything from source. Um, but yeah, most people in production will use like the current uh, stable release, which is called uh, Diablo. Um, but yeah, it's all in package management. It's in Ubuntu 11 10 or whatever. Yeah. Do you want to get into the whole eucalyptus versus OpenStack? Sure. Um, so OpenStack exists because eucalyptus sucked. <laughs> um, basically, we were using eucalyptus at NASA um, for some time. I wasn't there during this, this that period. The day I started is the day we decided to ditch eucalyptus and rewrite the whole thing in um, in Python. And we did so over the, over the weekend and already had a more stable system than, than our eucalyptus. Um, so. <laughs> So Eucalyptus had a, had a few problems. One, it was it was written very academically, um, so the it uses things like uh, like WS star. You know, it's like who actually uses that in the real world? You know, maybe some big company somewhere, but it's it's a pain in the ass if you're actually a developer. Um, it's uh, it was all in Java, which all of us hated, so none of us actually wanted to work on it. Um, it it had it's sort of like a two-faced open source project, so they have a premium offering, um, but they also have a uh, they also have the open source offering. Um, part of the premium offering is LDAP support. Uh, we wrote LDAP support and tried to submit a patch um, to the, the open source one. We're saying, hey, we wrote LDAP support because we needed it. Um, they said, well, uh, you know, it's kind of our premium, part of our premium offering. We don't want to include that in the open source project. Um, so we wrote some other small patches to like fix bugs. Um, none of those got accepted because they, they, build off of, they build off of their open source thing. And they have a separate a separate internal repository of what their of what the stuff that they ran is. So they couldn't apply our patch to their internal stuff. So they didn't want to. Um, they've already like fixed the bug for themselves, but haven't fixed it in the open source project. Um, it, ha it had it had some really weird it had some really weird behaviors like um, if uh, if it fails, it like deletes everything on the hard disk. <laughs> like so instead of, instead of and so like if an instance fails, it's just like psh, wipe it out rather than say like okay let's figure out what happened on it or something. Um, you know these are things that have changed. They um, in the year that uh, like OpenStack has existed, um, they've tried you know there's like a, now a fire under them to kind of move a bit faster because uh, Ubuntu dropped Ubuntu dropped like blessing of them. Ubuntu used to uh, used to like Eucalyptus, but they they said no more and we switched uh, Eucalyptus website says like NASA uses us and we're like. Nope. Um, so, so they had a lot of incentive to work on it quite hard, and they have, and they've rewritten most of it into C, um, which is preferable for most people to, to Java. Um, and yeah, they're doing they're doing good work, um, but I think we're we're f like ridiculously ahead of them now. Um, we have a much much larger community, it's Python, so it's cool, um, and yeah, there's like tons and tons of actual support, and so. Um, I think it's good to have competition. Um, I don't consider them competition yet. Um, but uh, I'll let you know how I really feel later on. <laughs> Anything else? Oh. Uh, so if you actually come up with a flood operation of your own, you uh, get some server, server space for it somewhere, uh -huh. and then you get some uh, other server space from elsewhere. If in case that the first one will go out or something, uh, okay. then you, you will need some kind of virtual private network. Is there some kind of prepared solution you have for that? Um, so you're talking about in two different data centers? Uh, or? Well, well for if, if you have this kind of, any kind of uh, tool site, or on the street more, maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so our, I mean, the S3, the Swift, which is the S3 um, 
like service already does a lot of replications and thing, a lot of replication and things like this, and yeah. so it already deals with like servers dropping off and things yeah, like that. Yeah, but uh, when you have multiple sites, you probably want some kind of peer-to-peer -peer network between all of them yeah. for management access and so on. Yeah. Uh, so do you have some kind of preferred? Uh, solution for that. So our our standard deployment when we're deploying this for um, like <coughs> clients who want to like who we deploy for, um, we use uh, generally we use three VLANs. So we have one that's uh, the VLAN between like the host machines and the infrastructure stuff. One that's a management thing. So like for example, management APIs only live on the management VLAN. Yeah. Um, and then one that is the public VLAN that gets uh, uh, I guess added into somehow. I'm not. I'm again not the network guy super much, but um, that actually reaches the public internet uh, from where the VMs are, right? So the VMs get put on the one for the public internet. The hosts are on a different one, and then. I'm more thinking that you probably have some kind of uh, uh, symbols that you can have some kind of symbol uh, uh, architecture that you have. You, you just have all the public servers on the public network. And so, uh, so this you is. You have some kind of VPN to the office side. There, there's, there's two, there's two, um, two, two interesting things with that. Uh, one is um, that's a that's a very similar setup to how we have at NASA. So there is a utility VM called CloudPipe that it, it's still floating around legacy in the code. That basically is the thing that sets up this VPN type thing. But um, Quantum is uh, one of the up and coming projects that's getting becoming part of OpenStack, which is basically a network management tool. Um, so the way it works, it uses Open vSwitch um, and works on Cisco routers and NICERA routers. Um, but basically, it provides a simple API that you can use from the management side as well as from the VM side, um, which basically you create you create a network like a network object, and you create ports on this on this object, and then you attach VMs, you attach basically other virtual ports on VMs to those things. So basically, you say, okay, all all these interfaces are connected to this this like virtual network. All these interfaces are connected to this one. These ones are connected to the public internet. Um, this one's not. Um, and that's that's basically it's it's customizable enough that they think it'll cover like you know 85 percent of most people's networking stuff. The problem is the hardware is very expensive that runs that stuff. Um, so, but that's that's basically been touted as the solution to most of these types of questions. Um, uh, quickly reconfigurable networks to deal with downtime and failovers and things like this. Um, I also think a lot of that has to do with how you design your site. Um, designing your site to deal with failover is uh, usually in my my like is my preference to having a very high, highly available backend, um, but it requires sort of flipping your brain around a little bit to to do it. Any more? One more last question. Anyone? Well, thank you, everybody. Yeah. And then I'd like to give you a packet. Uh -huh. uh, it's a button packet, it's a coffee packet. Okay. <laughs> it's a local coffee from Ethiopia. Cool. <laughs>